We persist because our work for peace makes a difference. We don't often see a march against war followed by a declaration from those in power that that war will not be pursued. But we know that it makes a difference in the life of the Lehigh Valley and in the lives of passers-by when we walk the 10 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem each December. Many people are reminded of the peace message that comes with Christmas and indeed with the other winter holidays. We know veterans and others are deeply moved when they see Veterans for Peace marching to end war, not simply to remember its soldier victims. We know our local peace camp for children and the others that are held elsewhere plant seeds of cooperation, tolerance, and a love of peace. One recipient of local draft counseling during the Vietnam War, who has long since moved from this valley, he donates to the Poco every year often including a note about the importance of that draft counseling in his life. We know the 2006 action and trial of the Dit 9 in the Lehigh Valley took the local questioning and concern about the Iraq War to a more serious level. I was sure we make a difference when in 1988 I sat in the dirt floor community building for some Guatemalan refugees in Mexico. A young teacher there asked us if we knew Brian Wilson, the Vietnam veteran whose legs were severed by a train as he sat on tracks in California, attempting to block weapons shipments to the wars in Central America. The teacher quoted Brian Wilson who had said, my life is worth no more than theirs. Theirs is worth no less than mine. We need to remember the words of Dennis Brutus, the South African poet, anti-apartheid fighter, and human rights activist who lived the difference that people's actions made in his country. Yes, indeed, we are up against the monsters of this world. Yes, indeed, they are masters of great power. But as my mother used to say, my dear old mother, my dear dead mother used to say, drink your tea and get your act together. There's a struggle to be waged. There's a battle to be won. We want peace and justice for the people of the world. We persist because we're preparing the way for change. The daunting crises that grip our world can lead even the most dedicated of us to despair. I'm sure we have all experienced times when we wondered, why do I continue this small effort against such overwhelming powers? It is at those times when I recall my saints of activism and hope. Our own Jenny Booth says, discouragement is a tool of oppression. The forces for the status quo of war and destruction of the natural world want us to be discouraged and thereby less likely to act for justice and peace. This alone is incentive to work hard, to tap our reservoir of hopefulness to keep us moving forward. Igor Rodinko, a World War II resistor, an activist with the War Resisters League, was a striking figure when I knew him in the 1980s with a long white beard and bushy hair on the partially balding head. He went on speaking tours for the WRL. I loved what I call his earthworm theory. He said that in our work as peace and nonviolent activists, we are like earthworms. We are continuously preparing the soil for the time when the rain comes and the sun shines and the seeds begin to grow. We are preparing for the time when a Rosa, Park or a Martin Luther, Rosa Parks or a Martin Luther King emerge to swell the ranks of activists. For a time when oppression becomes so weakened that a Pinochet loses his grip on Chile or the Berlin Wall falls. For a time when the opposition to war becomes a moving tide as it did with the huge demonstrations before the Iraq War in 2003. Pete Seeger talks about our inability to predict when our efforts will bring the positive change we seek. Unable to predict the future, we hold to the hope that change will come and to the knowledge that people have brought about such change in the past. Our own Joe DeRaymond wrote, it is up to us to resolutely try to hold accountable our government and corporate actors for their actions damaging humanity and the earth. To intervene if necessary with imagination, 
nerve and a commitment to a nonviolent ethic that is strong in its resistance and generous in its joyful approach to struggle. Howard Zinn, possibly the greatest hope monger, ended his autobiography, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic, it is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of a world in a different direction. If we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live, in defiance of all that is bad around us, is itself a marvelous victory. We persist because we are called to continue the important work of those who have preceded us. Need I mention in this gathering the powerful witness of the historic peace churches over the decades. The aftermath of World War I's horrors brought us organizations like the Fellowship of Reconciliation and the War Resisters League that today continue the important work for peace. In my family, I had uncles who were conscientious objectors during World War II. They served time in alternative service camps. The conscientious objectors and the resistors to that war made huge strides for peace and justice while in prison or while doing their service, but they also became leaders for moving peace forward after the war. We owe a huge debt to the strong, humane, and generous call for nuclear disarmament that came from the victims of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Ibakusha and their fellow citizens. It is to be remembered and honored that priests and nuns like the Berrigan brothers and Liz McAllister were the ones to fracture the good order and be jailed for burning draft files with napalm and for entering weapons facilities to ham hammer so swords into plowshares. We should also remember that in the 1980s, a feminist call took women to the Pentagon and other military sites to mourn, rage, defy the workplace of the imperial power which threatens us all. So this history leads us to break the new ground and find the message for peace that speaks in this age, this time, this place. <laughs>